Hello, Raihan. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here with you, Glenn. Yeah, well, it's very uh, uh, joyful for me to be able to welcome you. I'm Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show. The Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute, I'm proud to be able to say. And I am speaking with Raihan Salam, who is the president of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, not quite my boss, but uh, a guy who I uh, admire and respect and uh, whose direction I am open to uh, considering. <laughs> uh, and we're here to talk about uh, Manhattan Institute, uh, about uh, the Glenn Show and our merger and uh, other things of, uh, of mutual interest. So welcome. Well, Glenn. Uh, thank you again. And I just want to say more broadly, uh, I consider you um, a friend, uh, a mentor, someone who has been a real guiding light for me intellectually for a very long time. Uh, we haven't known each other for that long. We certainly have friends in common, uh, but I have been following your work very closely um, for a very long time. Uh, when I really first started uh, developing an interest um, in the world of ideas, of public policy, and what have you, you were an incredibly vital voice. Uh, you were also someone who was thinking courageously. You were questioning orthodoxies and conventional wisdom, but you were also questioning your own thinking rigorously. Uh, it's one reason why you were so unusual and refreshing, and it's one reason why you have been a guiding light, not just for me, but for a great many people, um, I uh, really think that, um, you know, you, you're a rare scholar uh, because, of course, your scholarly achievements are prodigious, but also you are just an incredible teacher. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about this partnership is because I really believe that that's what you're doing with The Glenn Show. You are drawing people out. You are educating this large swath um, of the kind of curious educated public that is unsatisfied uh, with a lot of the incumbent media institutions. They're unsatisfied with what prestige media has to offer. You're someone who has you know, achieved a lot of um, prestige, status, distinction, but you have never allowed that to um, make you uh, rigid. Uh, you are incredibly important. Uh, and I, I just really think about all the people like me when I first encountered your work, when I was, you know, in my teens, I think about people like that now who are on YouTube <laughs> watching God knows what. And then for some reason, they go down the algorithmic rabbit hole <laughs> and they find your work. And I just think about the world that you're unlocking for them, the uh, possibilities, uh, the questions uh, you're raising for them. Uh, and I just am incredibly grateful to get to be associated with that. I'm so, I think all of my colleagues at the Institute feel the same way. So forgive me for gushing, but um, <laughs> oh, you know, gosh. I just felt that I, I had to, I had to say that. You're going to make me blush. You know, I think I remember <laughs> our first meeting, if I'm not mistaken, it was at a dinner that Steve Tellus had organized in Washington, D.C., 20 years ago or something crazy like that. And uh, you were a young journalist writing really smart pieces for the magazines about this or that policy issue. And uh, here we are. So <laughs> thanks for the Steve kind Tellis, words. Steve Tellus, who is an incredible, uh, you know, just obviously, you know, frequent interlocutor of yours and of mine, uh, and someone who is just another, you know, just just real mensch. <laughs> People should know he's uh, professor of politics at Johns Hopkins University. And also, uh, he has a think tank affiliation, which I, escapes me just now. He's uh, a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center. Niskanen. But also, he, he, like you, is kind of a public goods provider. Uh, and, you know, he also, um, as, you know, everyone in the audience should know, co-edited uh, a volume with Glenn on ethnicity, social mobility, and human capital that uh, in some ways really prefigured a lot of the kind of big intellectual questions that Glenn has been taking on on the show and, and more broadly. So he's really a, a fellow traveler. You know, he's someone who I disagree with him about a great many things. I think that he would be relieved to hear me establish that he disagrees with me about many things. But, <laughs> but, but, he's a, but you know, it, that's the fun thing that I love too, just, uh, you know, just this idea of being a public goods provider in this world, you know, when, when you're thinking about what you do, Glenn, what we at the Manhattan Institute do, at our best, what we're doing is trying to lay the groundwork. You know, we're trying to uh, 
you know, basically help enrich the discourse. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously a very polarized moment. Um, you know, there's some people who think that what we're doing is not enriching the discourse, but that's really what I think you and I are aiming to do. Um, you know, we don't expect everyone to march in lockstep with our thinking, but people who are really thinking, you know, I think that that has a lot of value and also just, you know, to support that work, I think is, is really important too. So anyway, I'm babbling, but it's something I feel strongly about. How did you uh, come to make this turn uh, in your career to think tank management? What, what's the genesis of that? Uh, it uh, was uh, a happy um, confluence of circumstances. I was a journalist uh, for many, many years, and uh, I was at National Review prior to taking this role. Um, uh, there was an opening. Um, my predecessor, Larry Moen, my very distinguished and accomplished predecessor, who was at the Institute for a great many years, almost from its inception. He was there starting in the early 1980s, uh, and he was president for almost 25 years. Um, he was looking to move on, and so there was a search, and um, I raised my hand um, to be considered. Uh, and really, uh, for me, it felt on the one hand, like a big change, but also like a natural fit. Because, um, you know, though I'm someone who is, you know, I think, broadly conservative, I come from New York City. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in the thick of a real um, transformation, uh, really a, a set of overlapping transformations. One was an economic transformation, uh, something that you've thought very deeply about, Glenn, um, in which uh, you're moving to this knowledge-intensive, service-oriented economy that was leaving a lot of people behind. Uh, it was also a time of ethnic transition as well. Uh, you know, the Brooklyn that I grew up in was still, uh, certainly for um, older people, it was still a white ethnic city. And it was still a city where the kind of chief uh, ethnic conflict was a kind of black-white conflict. You know, it was a city that was much more diverse than that, but it was more diverse than that in a way that manifested itself in the public schools. Uh, you know, when you're looking at younger people, there, uh, you know, was this big immigrant second generation presence. Uh, but, you know, that world, as I grew up, uh, you know, was really in flux. And I grew up in the age of the Crown Heights riots. Uh, I grew up, uh, you know, the, the boycott of the Korean grocers. Uh, I grew up in a period when there was a lot of very intense uh, ethno-demographic change, um, a lot of political tumult that stemmed from that. And it was also a period when urban violence was really pervasive to the point where, you know, I grew up at a time when, uh, uh, when we were, bur uh, when we were burglarized, you didn't call the police, you know, you didn't bother to do that because, you know, again, it was just something like, Hey, it's, it's just like you get caught in a thunderstorm. You know, it happens sometimes and you've got to live with it and you've got to accept it. You've got to accept that you may well get mugged. Um, and you know, just, it feels like a very different world. It's a world that in some ways is coming back. But having seen the transformations uh, in New York City as I came of age was very formative for me. And, um, you know, I guess made me skeptical. Um, it made me curious. Um, and the Manhattan Institute and City Journal um, were very valuable for me in kind of shaping my understanding of how exactly those transformations um, unfolded. Uh, what were better paths we could take, uh, and what have you. So, um, you know, it, this is an institution that played a very big role in my intellectual formation. And looking at a larger um, center-right landscape that oftentimes seems very anti-urban, um, you know, a, a world where in an age of polarized politics, um, there's almost the sense that, you know, the left was seen as the party of diversity and the right was seen as the party of non-diversity. That's not something that reflected my experience. You know, my experience was that, um, you know, having um, cities rich in diversity, um, having places where you're creating pathways to upward mobility for lots of different kinds of people, that rests on the rule of law. You know, that rests on a sense of widespread public safety, that rests on a place where um, entrepreneurship is a possibility uh, for many different kinds of people. So, you know, in a way, I came at call it center-right politics, through this different avenue um, of seeing the possibilities of a kind of diverse entrepreneurial place. Um, and so that idea mattered to me a lot. And I felt like the Institute uh, was a place 
that reflected that sensibility, was built on that sensibility, a sensibility that I felt was just really urgently necessary in this moment again. Uh, and so I, I really wanted the job. <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to basically find people like you. And I wanted to find the person like you, but, you know, a bit younger, you know, who's just starting out, you know, who's not already an incredibly accomplished scholar. How can I find you? How can I find 10 of you? <laughs> you know, how can I find, you know, those people and give them the tools they need? Partly because in some ways, mainstream academia, prestige media are in some ways more hostile environments today than they were when I was starting out. Um, you know, how can we find a place where those um, difficult, challenging conversations, those um, that work that is really rigorously empirical, historically informed, thoughtful, serious, where that work can happen, um, and where it's people who are willing to go against the consensus. I wanted to, to kind of help build an institution like that. So that's what drew me into it. It's a conservative institution, is it not? Well, I will say that... Um, you know, Bill Hammett, who was a, a leader of the Manhattan Institute early in its history, was someone who I knew was Bill. very... You, Excuse me I'm for so, interrupting. Oh, no, please, please. But, but, but no, for all the way back to the early 80s, that's when I had my first Manhattan Institute experience. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I knew Bill Hammett. In fact, I heard from him recently. He, he still follows some of the stuff that I'm doing. I guess he's in retirement somewhere in the West. Uh, but uh, I would yeah. love to to see him. So that's, you know, that's something we should talk about uh, another well, if, time. Bill, but, if you're uh, listening, Rahan has <laughs> reached out. So I would love to talk. And I, I, last I heard is that, you know, he's fishing. He's just, you know, kind of enjoying a, a kind of a, a yeah. wonderful retirement. Uh, but uh, just, you know, my understanding is that he was very rigorous about avoiding ideological labels, which I think is admirable because in a way, you know, you are someone who is very much an independent intellectual. And as you mentioned in your conversation with John, um, that is something we prize and celebrate. You know, we do not want you marching in lockstep. You know, obviously, um, there are certain themes that resonate with our scholars. There's no question about that. But, um, you know, I would describe myself as a conservative. I have colleagues who have different sensibilities uh, on a range of different issues. Um, and it's important to me that we are not seen as narrowly sectarian. You know, we have our fixations, you know, we have our crusades, you know, we have things that we believe that, you know, others are not sufficiently attuned to, and therefore those are things that we're inclined to amplify. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, it's, you want a broad church because that's the only way, um, you're, you're kind of modeling the world you want to see to some degree. You know what I mean? Um, we're not brown, you know, we're not a place where, hey, you know, it's anything goes. <laughs> But, you know, we are a place uh, where we don't, we, we want to be led by ideas and evidence rather than teamsmanship, if that makes sense. Do you guys, or perhaps I should say, do us guys, do, do, do we have uh, any connections with the new mayoral administration in New York City? And more broadly, what, what is a relatively conservative, uh, free market uh, oriented uh, uh, institutions relationship to the structures of power in the city. Well, this is always an area where you want to tread lightly because, uh, you know, we are of course a nonpartisan organization, uh, but we do work with, uh, public officials, um, of, you know, any partisan coloration of any ideological coloration. Uh, and I will say that, um, our current mayor, Mayor Adams, uh, is someone who, uh, I believe has the right priorities. Um, you know, I think that he recognizes that New York City both uh, has an enormous opportunity, but also faces a lot of pretty profound challenges, public safety being issue number one. Uh, and yes. uh, I would say that his perspective on these issues, um, you know, is broadly aligned with ours. Um, and uh, I will say that um, you know, again, this is true of, you know, many different public officials, but, you know, we certainly make an effort to be a resource. Uh, but also, you know, these are these are public officials who are hearing from range different voices. I say this, Glenn, uh, because, you know, you know, the environment that we're in. Um, I certainly would not want it to be said that Mayor Adams marches in lockstep with uh, this or that right wing institution. <laughs> I certainly don't think that's true. But I also think that he's someone who is very sensitive to evidence. 
um, you know, he is someone who also recognizes that the constituency um, that was a very core part of his electoral coalition, and that is a constituency that, you know, I think that he is pretty attuned to, um, working class, lower middle class people living in the outer boroughs of New York City in particular, um, you know, many of them black, um, many of them, you know, coming from communities that have been historically disadvantaged. Um, you know, I think that he understands something that many other politicians do not understand. Politicians, whether they're Democratic, Republican, you name it, um, which is that, you know, these are communities that care very deeply about public safety, um, you know, because they see it as foundational. If you do not feel safe, uh, it is exceedingly difficult to build a flourishing life. Uh, you know, you know this work very well, Glenn. In fact, a lot of this work is work that I was introduced to through your work. Um, but, you know, the threat of violence hanging over you has a pretty profound effect on cognitive outcomes, on labor market outcomes. Uh, you and I were talking about the work of Elijah Anderson not long ago. And there's a way in which when you're talking about, you know, very violent neighborhoods, there's a stigma associated with being from those communities, whether or not you're a participant in that violence. Um, and I would say that, you know, this long period that unfortunately seems to have come to an end, but this long crime decline we've seen in our major cities, I actually think was in some ways um, a very good one for fostering um, social ties across racial lines and ethnic lines. You know, it, it was actually a time when, you know, when you feel this greater sense of safety, it makes people less defensive. You know, it means that actually people are willing to kind of come out of that defensive crouch that a lot of people are in, um, in communities that are scarred by violence. So anyway, I, I just think that that's extremely central and profound. And I believe that Mayor Adams feels the same way. I believe that, you know, the mayor feels hamstrung by basically forces that, you know, this sounds like excuse making, but I think it's true. Um, there are things that are happening in Albany in the state legislature. There are decisions that are being made by prosecutors that will really determine the success or failure of his project to restore public order uh, and to combat um, you know, serious violence um, in the poorest um most dangerous neighborhoods uh, in New York City. And by the way, New York City has a good relative to a lot of other cities. Even now, even though you've seen this incredible deterioration, uh, my, um, uh, I have a lot of family uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's a city that in some ways is a great story. You know, it's a city where e-commerce has created a lot of great blue collar employment opportunities. Um, you know, it's a place that, you know, has a low cost of living. It's a place where really it's, it's possible to climb from the working class to the middle class. But if you're living um, in the west side of Louisville, if you're living in these neighborhoods that I'm sorry to say are heavily black, um, you know, very poor, where you have a lot of multi-generational poverty, these are places that have gotten a lot more violent in recent years. And they've been violent for a long time. Uh, if you're looking at Baltimore, you know, you're just looking at so many cities around the country that were already struggling, even during that era when a lot of cities were getting much better. Um, you're seeing backsliding. Um, so anyway, uh, I've gone far away afield from Mayor Adams, but, um, you know, the short of it with yeah. Mayor Adams is that he, to me, is someone who represents something that could be incredibly important in democratic politics. And that's one reason why I really want to see him succeed. Democratic, small d. Well, actually... <laughs> Yes. So let me <laughs> let me take off my leader of an institution hat and say, yes, small D, but also capital D, um, capital D, because I'm, you know, maybe I'm I'll just lay my cards on the table. Um, I think that there is this sense, particularly for people who are highly, highly partisan, that, you know, the other side is so bad that I actually want them to get worse because, you know, kind of I want my <laughs> side to win and it's going to be easier if they get worse. And, and that is not my that is not my thinking. Um, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, Democrats are going to be in charge. Um, you know, Republicans are going to be in charge. We want good, thoughtful, responsible, pragmatic people, you know, people I might disagree with on many issues, but, you know, kind of to have that kernel. Uh, and so when it comes to democratic politics, um, I'm very struck by the fact that um, you do seem to have, and this is an oversimplification, but you do seem to have this very big gap between working and middle class 
black yeah. and brown Democrats and the sensibilities of the kind of people who dominate the kind of policymaking elite of the party. And so to the extent you can have people who really have strong, deep roots in um, communities of color, when, you know, more broadly, but, you know, being from New York City, that's something I, I kind of tend to gravitate towards. Um, and who can speak credibly. Um, you know, uh, Peter Scarry, who's a, a friend of yours and a friend of mine, uh, once made this brilliant observation uh, just about how when you look at advocacy organizations, they're oftentimes led by people who, um, you know, are typically educated, upper middle income people. And even if they come from, you know, non-white groups, from minority groups, um, they feel this legitimacy crisis. You know, well, am I truly authentic if I'm someone who, you know, has these credentials and kind of travel in this integrated world? So the way that they um, establish their bona fides is by making maximal demands. You know, how can I be as radical as possible? <laughs> how can I, you know, kind of be as transgressive you know, in a safe way, um, you know, in my kind of elite discourse as possible? You know, whereas you have a lot of people that they're ostensibly speaking for who are like, I just want safe streets, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, kind of want to be able to go to a decent school. I just want these very practical things. Um, and so there's this big disconnect there. Um, and I think it's a big problem for our politics. And it's a, a big problem when you think about this question of representation and representativeness. Um, and anyway, it's something that I think about a lot. And that's why I think a lot about people who have the moral authority or believe themselves to have the moral authority to dissent. Uh, because I think that those dissenters oftentimes, you know, this is a very familiar idea to you and to your listeners, but they actually speak in some ways more authentically, you know, for the, for, um, you know, working class, middle class communities it is just, you know, my perception. And I think that that transmission belt, the brokenness of that transmission belt is a big problem for our, uh, our public discourse. So Mayor Adams, uh, public safety is uh, issue number one. Um, what's the uh, Manhattan Institute's uh, portfolio of initiatives that bear on that area of public policy? And one thinks of Heather McDonald writing, uh, one thinks of Ralph Amangwell, who's got a book coming out. I understand he's a future guest here in a few weeks uh, at the Glenn Show, appropriate uh, given our, our new venture together. But uh, if you can, uh, would you? be able to characterize, you know, what the thinking is at the Manhattan Institute, broadly speaking, about the policing, crime punishment, uh, no bail, uh, cash bail, uh, you know, justice DAs, George Soros, uh, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in addition to Heather and Ralph, uh, we have built out uh, a really strong team working on um, issues of public safety. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, my colleagues, Hannah Myers and, and Charles Lehman and Robert Verbruggen. Uh, we also have a group of former prosecutors, um, Tom Hogan, Jonah Lucy Orban. These are people with decades of experience. Um, you know, we had a, a prosecutor recently um, uh, from Queens uh, who just wrote a brilliant piece on New York State's bail law. But, but anyway, we, we kind of cover a range of different issues. But I'd say the core of it is this insight that, um, you know, you know that a lot of folks on the right, um, their sine qua non is that we want government to be smaller, we want it to be cheaper, we want it to limit its scope. But what you'll find is that, you know, for, for many, many different people, whether they're on the right or left, there is this view that the rule of law is essential, uh, you know, kind of uh, enforcing the law is essential. And, you know, what a lot of our scholars are converging on is this belief that when you're looking at our criminal justice system, Actually, the problem is not that we've overinvested in it. The problem is that we've underinvested in it. Now, that's that's clearly a very contrarian view. But if you look, look at the last couple of years, uh, our scholars have, have just observed that you saw a collapse in the number of people who were uh, in jails and prisons. Now, you know, there was over a longer period of time, you know, over a kind of 10, 15 year period of time, uh, you know, particularly as crime rates fell, there was a gentle downward decline in incarceration rates uh, that, you know, I believe was responsive to, you know, changes in the public safety environment. But then, you know, uh, with COVID, you had a really, really sharp decline. And then it wasn't just COVID. There were also a bunch of different legal reforms happening in states and cities around the country, not just, you know, blue states and cities, by the way, and red states and cities as well. 
And so basically, you could say that the capacity of the criminal justice system changed pretty markedly over a short period of time. That capacity is also affected in other ways, too. So, for example, if you're a prosecutor, you have the exact same budget that you had before, but now you have a bunch of new requirements. Uh, here in New York City, in New York State, you have discovery reform. Uh, you know, you have a bunch of new requirements that say that, you know, we are going to basically change the playing field in a way that will make your job as a prosecutor someone more difficult. By the way, that may well be a good and reasonable thing to do. Maybe we want to see to it that public defenders uh, you know, are in a more favorable position. Maybe the system was too balanced in one direction. But you know, again, what you're doing is you're saying we're, we're creating these new burdens without providing you with new resources as well. So you know, similarly, when you talk about you know, our prisons, one thing that many people have rightly pointed out is that there are many prisons uh, in our country uh, where you have serious violence. You know, you are someone who has been, you know, um, you know, handed a sentence, you're serving your time. That does not therefore mean that you should be living in a lawless environment in which you have to be concerned about your personal safety at any given moment. So, you know, in a way, how do we think about that? Some people's takeaway from that is that, well, we need to decarcerate. We shouldn't have people in prison at all. Another way to, th- I, I don't want to be unfair. We should have drastically fewer people yeah. in prison. Another view is that, well, look, we're going to have the number of uh, people in prison that we ought to have given the threat posed by serious chronic violent offenders. But conditions in those prisons should be decent and humane. We should have sufficient resources so that actually people are able to be safe and secure there. And also, by the way, people will eventually get out of prison. So that could mean that we should invest in the idea that, you know, we don't want all of your skills to erode. We want to create opportunities for you to be reintegrated into the community. So anyway, I kind of think that in a way, what you've seen from some um, people who characterize themselves as criminal justice reforms, uh, reformers, excuse me, criminal justice progressives, what they're actually pursuing is a star of the beast agenda. You remember the kind of old, you know, kind of right wing star of the beast idea, which is that if you just um, basically slash taxes enough, you will have to slash government. Uh, you will have to kind of force it to become small enough so that we can drown it in a bathtub. There is a kind of progressive star of the beast attitude when it comes to criminal justice, which is let's basically, and I don't think that this is deliberate or intentional, but well, in some cases, I think it is deliberate and digital, but that's a separate issue. But the idea is, you know, let's apply new burdens on the system. Uh, you know, we believe that uh, incarceration is presumptively unjust. And so let's actually almost create this humanitarian crisis so that the answer to the humanitarian crisis is let's shut down more jails and prison facilities, as opposed to this is actually something that is part and parcel uh, of a civilized society. You know, if we are going to keep certain communities safe, you know, we need to isolate some people who are otherwise going to be dangerous from the wider community. That does not mean that we treat them inhumanely and what have you. You see what I mean? So I think that this kind of progressive star of the beast, um, and by the way, there are some people on the left, uh, on the right, um, you know, who also, you know, kind of embrace the sensibility of whether they did this thoughtfully, judiciously, conscientiously or not is a separate question. And I'd say that the kind of big picture view, and, you know, our scholars have different views on different questions, certainly, but I think that that is a big picture view that actually, even if you are a limited government conservative, the state needs to have the capacity to do its job well. That is true when it comes to all sorts of public goods. That's true when it comes to public education. And that sure as heck is true when it comes to our criminal justice system. You and I can disagree about how long someone should be incarcerated for this or that crime. You know, you and I might disagree about how we should allocate resources to the police, um, what kind of tactics the police you know, ought to be using. But you know, let's acknowledge that if you want police officers who are responsive, um, who are professional, who are experienced, who are well-trained, that's not free. So I think that that is a big um, you know, kind of core idea that, that our team is advancing. Okay. What about education? That would be another policy area that I uh, imagine the Institute is fairly, uh, you know, heavily invested in. Uh, what, what, what are some of the uh, initiatives, some of the scholars' work that's going on and so on that 
respect to school choice and whatnot, with respect to testing. You're a graduate of what, Bronx High School of Science? I went to Stuyvesant High School. Or Brooklyn Tech. I went to Stuyvesant, um, and uh, I, uh, Brooklyn Tech, um, Bronx Science, incredible schools. One thing that is a big difference now than when I was going to high school in the 1990s is that, um, you know, under Mayor Bloomberg, uh, there were many new schools that were created. Um, in the city. Uh, and uh, many of them are quite, quite strong. And I mention that uh, in a way because it reflects uh, one of our core arguments. Um, Ray DeMonico, our director of education policy, often makes this point. What you see in New York City, San Francisco, Northern Virginia, cities around the country is a hostility to schools like the one that I attended. These, you know, exam-based specialized selective high schools. Um, and, um, you know, I guess Ray's frustration, which I share and that, you know, others on our team share is that, you know, what you do is, okay, let's look at the demographic mix at this one school and let's basically have this big political debate over the composition of that school, you know, what we should do about that school. But then, well, wait a second, you have hundreds of thousands of other high school students in the system. And so what, you know, Mayor Bloomberg did, you know, his genius, um, you know, that of the, the people he brought to work for him, many of whom were well to the left of him, by the way. But their thought was, what we want is an abundance agenda. You know, it's a term that people use when it comes to energy policy or housing policy, but in schools too, it's, it was an abundance agenda. Let's create more seats. Uh, because, you know, rather than fighting over the fixed pie of seats at this one institution, you know, what is it we, and by the way, you know, those institutions, you know, I, I say this against interest. And, you know, I, I believe that they should, I'm comfortable with the admissions policy they have right now. But the big thing is that, you know, you know, selection does a lot of work. When you're looking at the the supposed achievements of these students, I shouldn't say that they're real achievements, they're real achievements. When you look at the achievements of these students, how much of that is the incredible stuff that's happening in the curriculum or with the teachers and how much of it is simply peer effects and how much is simply that, you know, you have a cutoff and, and there you go. So I kind of think that when you talk about changing the composition of these schools, it's like, if it's all about the peer effects, if it's all about selection, you know, you might have won a symbolic victory. But what I want to know about, what we want to know about is what are the schools where there's actually some special sauce? You know, what are, what are the schools where actually there's some instructional model there's some way they're combining talent. You know, there's some way they're they're actually kind of learning how to get the best out of exceptionally bright kids who, you know, might um, not be socialized into, um, you know, academic achievement. You know what I'm talking about? So, so that was the kind of sensibility then, you know, let's create new institutions that are really specialized in this way. And of course, that was the kind of impetus behind the charter movement as well. And so I think that you know, to me and our education scholars, you know, the idea is how do we actually increase the number of seats in good schools? Because actually, in a way, what you want to do is say that Stuyvesant and Bronx Science and and Brooklyn Tech and Lowell High School in San Francisco and Thomas Jefferson High School, you want them to become kind of less relevant. You want it to be a situation where it's not, um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, for me, honestly, the big thing was I just wanted to go to a high school where I wasn't going to get beaten up. You know, I think that that was really the motivation. And, you know, it was like, you know, I was uh, you know, always going to public schools. Like any alternative to public schools wasn't really on our radar. You know, it wasn't really a possibility. But, you know, chances of getting beaten up there were substantially lower than they were elsewhere. Um, now there are a lot more options, you know, for places that are basically safe um, and also where you're going to get a pretty good education. And that's a good thing. The gradient is different. You know, the kind of urgency to kind of get them into this tiny hand school of schools is different. But there's backsliding there. Um, so, so that's a big part of it. And, you know, of course, we talk about charter schools and education savings accounts and vouchers and what have you. But uh, the core of it is this idea of pluralism, the idea that we want schools work best when they fit the values and sensibilities of parents. Because, you know, you're in school, call it eight hours a day you're in your family, you're in your world for, you know, much more than that. And when you're in a school that kind of matches those sensibilities, that aligns and values terms, you can get much more out of that experience, number one. And number two, pluralism in the sense of, you know, there are people who want to go down an academic track and are going to flourish by, you know, getting a four-year degree and, and what have you. And there are other people who want different kinds of preparation. Um, you know, they want different post-secondary pathways. That should be valid and legitimate. And, you know, we should think about ways that don't feel like you're shunting people off 
you know, into some no man's land, but something where maybe I'm going to want to work for two years before going to college or something along those lines. Maybe I want to have earning and learning opportunities when I'm in high school, uh, because that's a priority for me and it's a priority for my family. And it's a way for me to be motivated. Um, I have two sisters, you know, one of whom, uh, you know, they both went to my high school, one of whom really struggled there. And it was partly because both of my sisters, they worked from when they were 14 years old. And she just really felt like that's where I thrive. That's what actually gets the best out of me. Um, and though, you know, I think she was quite bright, um, you know, that was something that was a big struggle. And I kind of think that there are many other students who are in less favorable circumstances where you can get the best out of them in a different way. Um, and I think that the kind of one size fits all mentality is incredibly destructive to people's sense of self and purpose and value. Um, anyway, I'm kind of going on and on, but I think the pluralism along those two dimensions is something that I think um, undergirds a lot of the work that we do. Well, this is interesting. I think people might be a little bit surprised. I mean, you talk about prisons and you note that the enrollments are going down, but you say that the quality of what's happening in terms of the experience of people inside is something we should be very much concerned about. You want law and order, but you don't want uh, vengeance just at, enacted for its own sake. Uh, not to put words in your mouth, but that's what I heard. Uh, I also hear you saying that, yeah, we can fight over who gets into Brooklyn Tech and Stuyvesant and Bronx Science. But uh, the deeper questions are about what constitutes a quality education for kids, not all of whom are going to be on some uh, fast academic track heading them to the Ivy League. And uh, that is something that uh, is... Uh, uh, fed by structural change. I, I want to understand a little bit more about that. Um, what were these schools that Bloomberg uh, uh, stood up that were not the, the specialized exam schools, but that were nevertheless uh, more effective? Were, were they mainly charters, for example? There was the charter system, which, um, you know, and this varies from city to city, but was, you know, quite autonomous um, and, you know, were uh, authorized under um, state legislation and also authorized by, for example, the state university system. And, and there are a couple of other charter authorizers in New York State. But then within the Department of Education, he created new schools that were not charter schools that were under the aegis of the kind of city of New York. But where basically he was turning to teachers, administrators, he was turning to educators within the DOE system to create new models. And so, you know, one difference is that in the charter system, for example, um, you know, it's typically the case that those schools are not operating under the collective bargaining contract of the DOE, whereas these new vision schools, these kind of separate schools are. So, you know, they're in some ways more constrained, but some of these schools really did create incredible new models. Um, and, um, you know, th th there are so many, but, you know, one common characteristic is that they were typically smaller. So in New York City, you know, you would have these big high schools. Uh, I went to a high school that, you know, again, you know, while selective, um, you know, had, uh, you know, well over 2,000 students. Uh, and, you know, that's not uncommon at all. So one strategy was let's simply create schools that are a bit smaller and more manageable so that the kind of leadership team, you know, can kind of get its arm around the problem. And also so the schools can be specialized along um, different dimensions. So, you know, you'll have a high school focused on criminal justice as a theme, um, on urban agriculture, you know, on any number of things. Now, the one thing is that, you know, you could say, oh, well, is that very practical? You know, you're you're going into the ninth grade and you're going to decide that your life is going to be about forestry or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of going into legal profession, something like that. Well, in a way, that was just a way to kind of give some coherence, you know, to the school to kind of give it some um, sense of cohesion. But it's not necessarily all about that. You know, it's just something that can kind of help rally the troops and give the school a bit of an identity. Um, and, you know, overall, of course, there's wide variation in these schools. But, you know, one thing you did find is that these schools were oftentimes more expensive per student than a typical high school in New York City. But they cost about the same, if not less, per graduate. They were graduating more students, even when you're kind of comparing kind of, you know, quite similar students. Um, you know, yeah. there are people on my team who are much more expert in the kind of specifics. Um, but, you know, I, I, the kind of big takeaway was that these schools really did seem to make a big difference. And then under Mayor Bloomberg's uh, successor, uh, Mayor de Blasio, there really wasn't nearly as much movement in this direction uh, of trying to kind of disaggregate these schools. Uh, and, you know, again, you never want to say that there's a silver bullet. 
I think that you and I share this, you know, because that's always a danger. You know, you find something that works and then you say, aha, we will distill this one thing mm-hmm. that could actually be part of a complex bundle of many different things that are working together. Mm-hmm. It could be a product of talent, could be product of a unique moment. It could be product of like, hey, you know, the kind of immigration history of the city, who knows? Um, so you never, that's always a danger with people like us. You know, you kind of take something that emerged from practice and kind of circumstance and you kind of make it rigid and you kind of, you know what I'm talking about? And I think that that's always something that's dangerous, yeah. but it was something where it was really a kind of try on error sensibility. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it seemed to work very well. And I, I'm a little biased because I know a fair number of, of teachers who are involved in the process of creating some of these schools. Um, and, uh, you know, one big challenge is that when you create this more pluralistic model, you also want to be sure that the central body is doing important work too. So for example, one thing that critics of the charter system oftentimes raise is looking at uh, school discipline and expulsions. You know, hey, so, you know, is this basically a kind of selection effect when you're looking at, you know, kind of good outcomes? Are you churning through students who um, are troubled um, and who might be disruptive in the classroom? You want to be sure that the kind of central administration is ensuring that that's not what's happening and that students who are disruptive, who, you know, kind of who do pose certain challenges are actually getting the services they need. Uh, You know, that's a kind of separate issue, but it's something that I think about a lot, something that our theme, our team thinks about a lot. Um, and, and also how do you make sure that actually, um, you are protecting broad standards so that, you know, you're not, yes, you want some pluralism, openness, diversity competition, but how do you ensure that there aren't students who are being left behind? Um, and you know, there are no guarantees in this life, but there are some things that, you know, kind of thoughtful oversight can help address. Uh, so anyway, that, that's also something that we work on. I want to talk about race. Um, So the battle over critical race theory in the schools, Christopher Rufo, one of our guys, Uh, the larger battle about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Heather McDonald just had a piece on medical education that I read with great interest in your magazine, our magazine, City Journal, one of our gals. Uh, You're in New York City, you know, tinderbox and all of that. There's a lot of structural tensions going on on the racial front. Um, how do you see positioning the Institute in this uh, big uh, culture, political uh, arena of conflict around racial justice in the post-George Floyd era? This is a very big, profound set of questions. We have people at the Institute who have somewhat different approaches to it, how to think about it. Um, I will say, for my purposes, I really believe that um, there are a lot of shibboleths about race and identity that we're seeing come undone right before our eyes. Um, The whole construct of people of color, the idea of flattening uh, the experiences and sensibilities of these kind of census-created categories, uh, I think that stuff is just blowing up right now. Um, and, uh, so I think that it's a very important moment because of that for fresh thinking. So just to, you know, specify what I mean by that. Um, I think that, um, when you're looking at the black American experience, which is itself, uh, you know, incredibly rich, complex, diverse, um, in a way it has become a kind of default template for how to understand the experience of other minority groups as well which I think is um, very misleading, you know, number one. Um, and number two, when you think about the, the Black experience, it is something where you're seeing this incredible pluralization of the Black experience uh, due to immigration-driven change, uh, due to intermarriage, uh, due to migration. Uh, there is a, um, you know, a lot of scholars who are, who've been looking at how immigration is driving the remaking of Black America, you know, more broadly. Um, you know, one great insight, um, you know, from a Princeton sociologist um, you know, whose name escapes me at the moment, but who's done this kind of wonderful work um, looking at, you know, not comparing foreign-born Black Americans to native-born Black Americans, but rather foreign-born Black Americans to Black movers 
people who move from one city to another over the course of their lives, because, you know, you're talking about different selected populations. You know, you saw this when you're looking at the history of the, the Great Migration as well. So anyway, just I think that for me personally, a big part of my agenda is just pluralization. You know, how do we actually stop flattening the experiences of groups, including white Americans, by the way? And how can we try to look at these experiences as multidimensional and as more complex? So you could say that, you know, part of this is just about looking at people more as individuals, right? But I think that it's about more than that. And I think that this is something that you, I think, have really highlighted. And I think that it's something that, you know, I think it's been an important moral kernel of your work as well, which is that, um, yes, we might want to be more nuanced and, you know, we might want to, um, you know, kind of uh, look at other cleavages, you know, within different populations and communities. But that idea of community is important. That idea of group cohesion and shared history is important. Um, and I think that that's something that I find really interesting and important. And then the question is, to what extent should that be voluntaristic? Or to what extent should that be structured through institutions like race preferences uh, or institutions like, you know, we're creating groups through the census or through the ideas of um, ascribing disadvantage? Does that make sense? I, I, I'm sort of babbling here, but I kind of think that in a way, having identities that feel more bottom up and that are kind of driven by mutual aid and by, uh, you know, driven by shared history and a belief in shared history. I think that that's important and dignity bearing. And I think that identities that are imposed from above, um, I think they're problematic, man. <laughs> I, mean, I think that there's a way in which, you know, and, and there can be a place for them. And there's oftentimes a good reason why we're like, hey, you know, there are communities that are historically disadvantaged and stigmatized. And, you know, for the purposes of understanding, we want to kind of highlight them and understand them. I, I get that. But I also worry about reifying kind of, and actually I create my group boundaries because they serve my purposes. You know, I'm elite university X and defining group boundaries in this way. And then saying that an authentic representative of the group thinks these things that serves my purposes. But I don't know about what serves my purposes as actually a member of a living, breathing community. You know what I mean? And there might be a tension between those two things. And particularly when you're talking about communities that are historically disadvantaged, where you haven't necessarily had the same kind of wealth creation and institution building, that means that, hey, I'm going to start pushing you around. You know, if you are someone who denies the Armenian genocide, then I'm going to have a problem with it. And by the way, I've got a lot of other people of Armenian descent here, and they're going to make a stink about it too. And you're going to have to answer to us. Like in some ways, the new discourse we have about race and ethnicity, part of it, I think, is a healthy reflection of the fact that different people are rich now. Different people are famous now. Different people have power now. And they're going to exert that power. And that might be uncomfortable. They're going to exert that power politically, economically, and otherwise. I think that that is something that is a good, healthy, natural thing. But to what extent is it not that kind of exercise of power, that kind of democratic contestation, that kind of economic contestation? To what extent is it, and again, I'm going to sound silly and, and crude, but to what extent is it, no, is no, it no. something that is driven by institutions that are not kind of organic in that kind of way, that are not actually reflecting that kind of interplay of mutual aid, self-help, communal power. So that's one reason why I'm so obsessed with you, Glenn, <laughs> because I got to think that when you talk about black self-making, you know, when, when you wrote about the development narrative, to me, that was my lodestar. That is this idea that, and, and, and again, like when you talk about the bias narrative and the development narrative, you're not saying that the bias narrative is wrong and the development narrative is right. You know, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's just which do you emphasize when what is going to be our, our framework for understanding our challenges, our condition? You know, even it could be that bias is pervasive. Well, then what do you do about that? You know, kind of fixating on the bias narrative. It, it, it's not obvious that you, you continue to kind of fixate on it. So the development narrative idea to me is so interesting. And I, I think that it's an idea that is almost this folk idea that makes so much sense to so many people, but there aren't that many articulate 
scholarly champions of that idea, partly because it's a textured idea. It's an idea that requires a sensitivity and narrative understanding. It's not something that is easily quantifiable. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. I, I, so I just think that that to me is very important. And that that is a big part of how I think about <laughs> progress and group membership and group identity. And the things that I think are um, we overweight and the things we underweight. I confess to being of two minds about this bottom up uh, idea about racial identity and about where the boundaries get drawn and how we identify. On the one hand, I want to say in the spirit of a kind of liberal, liberal or liber, even a libertarian kind of, you know, let's look at individuals and let's not put people in these boxes. People are black or they're Latino or they're Asian, quote unquote. We have these horrible things, you know, they're BIPOCs, we, you know, they're people of color, these, these aggregations that are poli politically instrumental, but that I think are false to, to reality. And I, and I want to, you know, tell young people of color, you know, the world is your oyster and you can be anything and uh, you can do anything and, and, and don't limit yourself. I want to tell my college students, you know, read broadly, think broadly, learn languages, expose yourself to things. Don't come in here like that. On the other hand, I want to exhort, quote unquote, my people to act. I want agency. Uh, I want collective action. I, I, I want people to be motivated by a sense of duty to their future generations, to a sense of obligation because of the sacrifices of past generations. I want to embrace a narrative that's thick with racial uh, content as an African-American even though I also in the 21st century with the world getting very small, want people to open up and embrace and be free. So I, I got into this uh, discussion with Camille Foster, whom you will know, uh, who is a, a race abolitionist, if I understand him correctly. He's black in appearance, but he says, you know, don't call me black. I'm not black. I mean, I, I, you know, don't put me in that box. I, I'm, a, I'm a man. I'm a human being. I'm an American. I'm, you know, I'm a father. I'm an intellectual, you know like that. And I was saying, yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. But if we think the black family is part of the developmental problem that kids are not getting the kind of support that they need and the kind of nurturance that they need, in part because of the way that men and women are relating to each other, marrying, forming family and so forth. How do, how do we even begin to talk in a effective way about mobilizing our cultural resources on behalf of the project of raising our kids if, if we don't uh, have this framework and this uh, interpretation of our history, quote unquote, uh, to, to draw on. So I'm of two minds about it. But the other thing that I wanted to say and I want to ask you is, doesn't the logic, the electoral logic of the Democratic Party require exactly the thing that you're against? top-down categorization and calculate. I mean, the president, Biden, while running says, I'm going to make a black woman this and I'm going to make the black woman that. And, and it's isn't this pandering built into the electoral logic of the party? And isn't it at least part of our problem? I suppose there's something we could say on the other side about reaction against CRT and Republican electoral ambitions. But uh so let's leave it as party politics and uh, the instrumental use of racial identity. Well, there's so much here. So, um, you know, you, ha I know, have uh, thought quite a bit about this. You know, there's the wonderful book, Steadfast Democrats, about uh, basically, um, you know, the sources yeah. of partisan loyalty and black political unity. And it's complicated because it's closely related to exactly what you're describing, this kind of idea of loyalty, of group loyalty, group cohesion. Uh, you know, one of the one thing that I've always thought about is um, just this idea that people with a kind of conservative orientation, you know, small C conservative orientation, you know, in the kind of big picture sense, these ideas of loyalty, of group loyalty are they matter. And it reminds me of that old line. Do you remember Tony Robbins? Excuse me. No, Tony Roberts journal. He was a, oh gosh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, that's Tony, Brown, Tony, Brown, Tony Brown's sorry, yeah, journal. Uh, but yes. Um, you know, he was this fascinating no. political figure who, who made the observation that the black right was aligned with a non-black left 
uh, you know, basically kind of integrationist and, uh, you know, kind of focused on, um, you know, that kind of approach to um, black flourishing, whereas the black left, which he, you know, by which he meant the kind of nationalist kind of community oriented, you know, Mm -hmm. it should be aligned with a non black right you know what I mean? which white, is right. you know, sort of uh, you know yeah. uh, again like you can kind of debate that but it is interesting the idea and you know this is something that you know is a part of um justice clarence thomas's thinking as well you know his particular style of black nationalism um but uh, well, I, I think actually there's there's kind of a lot here but you know this idea that um black political unity matters most for people who are embedded in um largely, if not exclusively, black social networks, Uh, you know, because those are people for whom, even if you are ideologically more conservative on any number of kind of core issues that have a partisan valence, but, you know, ultimately the sense that, well, group loyalty comes first, that's what matters most. So when you look at black Americans who do lead more integrated lives, uh, then those are people where that, um, that sense of obligation and kind of duty, you know, attenuates somewhat. Um, But then it's an interesting question how is African-American political unity being leveraged? And by whom is it being leveraged? Who are the people who are setting the signals as to kind of what it means to be kind of authentically black or lower to the group, a loyal to the group? And I think that there is something in flux right now. You know, I'm not saying that I expect any big change in terms of partisanship, but I do think that partly because of the pluralization of black life, you know, there's always, say there's always been a talented 10th, you know what I mean? And and there's always been this group that is, you know, educated, affluent, but the sense that it's a group that is educated, affluent, but that has authentic ties to the community. Um, and that therefore uh, merits a modicum of deference, you know, in terms of, you know, which direction should we go, you know, kind of how should we kind of apply this kind of political unity. And I do think that one thing that is very kind of confusing, fraught, and contested, and I'm curious to see how it unfolds, is the fact that because of the rise of the first and second generation black population, and because of the rise of a these complex dynamics of colorism happening against the backdrop of the emergence of a mixed race black population that, you know, kind of um, is perhaps overrepresented among people who are educated and affluent and are in positions of influence, I'm curious about how that affects these dynamics, um, not just of black political unity, but of what it actually means. Uh, you know, you have these interesting internet subcultures, um, you know, that, um, you know, for example, are skeptical towards conventional feminism. But then when you're looking at black political power, um, you know, it's not just black Americans, but black women who are this incredibly important bulwark of democratic political strength, not just when it comes to, you know, the voting base, but when it comes to who are people who are increasingly important as policy thinkers, as intellectuals, you know, who are people who have been kind of really generative um, and who kind of embrace the kind of call it intersectional feminism, you know, as applied to policy. These are really interesting dynamics where I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that there's some reaction that does not necessarily translate into people voting for Republicans en masse, but in thinking that, hey, the talented 10th is not what it was in, you know, the Du Bois era, you know, kind of when you had these intensely segregated cities and you had this, um, you know, professional class that earned its keep by kind of serving this segregated population. You know, now, you know, you have a talented 10th, you know, that, you know, kind of, it basically swims in the sea of kind of selective higher education and the universe that it creates. You know, people sometimes will say that, oh, selective higher education is marginal. People like you fixate on that too much. But, you know, in a way, it's like the moral imagination of so much of the upper middle class, black or non-black, um, is to some degree formed by yeah. uh, admissions offices. Because the admissions office says, we want well-rounded kids or we want well-lopsided kids. Um there's a kind of wonderful new book about this called Little Platoons. <laughs> but it, and, and it's sort of like, um, yeah, like in saying that you you establish what parents want to do, whether they know it or not. You know, what I mean? like every single school is going to kind of move in that direction. So when you have that cleavage among black Americans, I think that it introduces the possibility of a dissenting faction 
within the talented tenth, you know, call it that, you know, you kind of have room for these different voices, which again, you can kind of marginalize and kind of say, oh, you know, these are people who are relevant, you know, kind of this doesn't matter. They don't speak for anyone. You could say that for a while, but then when you have these political earthquakes, intra-democratic political earthquakes, by the way, when you kind of see these different people emerge, um, I think that's really interesting. And then I don't know, like, do you see some counter elite emerge? I, I, that might be a bridge too far, but I, I think, you know, within the black intelligentsia, you know, kind of within that world. And of course, you know, there are kind of other complex dynamics that exist within other communities. You know, briefly, I'll say, um, you know, among Asian Americans, um, it is really interesting, the, the discourse about racial preferences. If you are um, an, a, 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 an Asian American professor at Brown University, the likelihood that you are opposed to racial preferences, I, I'd say it's close to zero. Um, it, yeah, and, and somebody, you know, there are all sorts of reasons for that. It's like you're steeped in, you know. Well, I mean, if you right, are, you'll never right. say you are. And, and there are all sorts of reasons that's true. But, you know, there is also this other kind of, and, and you know, again, this is impressionistic. And I don't think this is experienced self-consciously. But there's a way in which if you are someone from a group who made it through the gauntlet, and you're, you're the kind of person where the system decided that you are actually virtuous, and, you know, kind of you are, you know, kind of this or that, you're not going to say, well, out of some sense of peoplehood that, well, but my other people are, you know, kind of, no, I mean, you're just kind of like, well, those, it's not that you actually literally think those people who complain about these things are losers, but, you know, there is a way in which, why would you want to associate yourself with the people who were not deemed, you know, part of this, you know, kind of virtuous group, you know, who kind of were not, you know what I mean? It's this kind of weird, complicated dynamic, like the, the very act of selection creates its own group interest and its own kind of collective interest and its own, um, you know, sense of self-belief and, and how that kind of shapes your worldview. It's really, really interesting. So like these groups that are artificial, they're reified by these processes. You know what I mean? They're reified by this process of selection. They're reified by the ethnic studies department. <laughs> they're kind of reified by the kind of culture that grows from that. And I kind of think that this, um, I call it this, the emergence of the black cosmopolitans, this kind of black cosmopolitan identity and group with its own interests and cohesion um, is interesting. And I think that in some ways is, I won't say antagonistic, but it relates complexly to this kind of larger fact of um, persistent, durable, real, um, uh, endogamous black community. You know what I mean? Uh, and anyway, I think that you think about yeah. this in a much more subtle way than most. And, and obviously it's something that, you know, um, I uh, understand imperfectly, but I, I find it very, very interesting. Uh, I find your remarks very, very stimulating as I did at the conference. So um, a lot to think about. I think everybody can see as we conclude here that uh, the Manhattan Institute, where I am now a John Paulson fellow, I'm proud to be able to say, and where the Glenn Show is being sponsored, uh, is led by uh, a serious intellectual, a very reflective and articulate gentleman, and I'm proud to be affiliated with you. Thank you right so now. much, Glenn. I'm so excited uh, and honored, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Very good. Bye now.